So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to thank the organizers. I thoroughly enjoyed myself uh, this morning. Um, I was also thrilled with the music. Um, I About much more than 30 years ago, when I, I uh, graduated with my music performance degree, I played the Messiaen Merle Noir. And uh, so it was just uh, thrilling and brought me back uh, to, to hear it again here. Um, it also has made me realize, uh, in those days, I felt like I had two separate lives, my music life and my science life. And uh, more and more, uh, the science community, and I think uh, the music community as well, are realizing that we have a lot uh, to talk to each other about. And um, I find that all very exciting. I'm going to focus today largely on rhythm, why I think rhythm is so crucial to who we are as human beings. Um, and I'm going to talk both about research we've done in adults and in young uh, infants and kids. Uh, but I wanted to just start with a few general remarks about musical development. Um, so we are musical creatures, and music is a huge part, uh, as Antonio uh, described this, mo this morning, uh, music is a huge part of the infant's world. Uh, so the way we talk to infants and also the way we sing to infants. So here's a mother singing a song. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, wall, wall, bing, bang. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, wall, wall, bing. And here's the same mother singing the same song. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, wall, wall, bing, bang. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, wall, wall, bing, bang. Okay, so sung completely differently. And in this study uh, from some time ago, we asked mothers to sing these songs in different caretaking situations. So one, the first one was obviously a lullaby, the second a play song. So parents around the world in every culture that we can, that has been studied, use music to help their infants regulate their state. Uh, which gets back to this whole idea about, uh, you know, self-regulation, um, homeostasis, and, and so on. And music is a means by which uh, parents are helping their infants to achieve uh, self-regulation right from the beginning. When we look at young infants, they don't yet really know a particular musical language, like Western tonality, just like they don't know the, the language yet of their environment. But there are certain elements of music that seem to be present really early and are perhaps largely uh, controlled by innate factors. And one of those is sensitivity to consonants versus dissonance, uh, just in the, in the psychophysical sense. And I don't have time here to go through all the, the details, but the, I, the differentiation between consonants and dissonance arises actually in the structure of the ear uh, and evolved actually for things like auditory scene analysis rather than music, but it forms one of the most important aspects of, of musical pitch structure. But because it's physiologically instantiated both in terms of tonotopic maps that represent frequency and also in terms of timing uh, processes in the brain, we thought that maybe infants would be sensitive to consonants versus dissonants from very early on, and that's exactly what we found. So this is an old uh, videotape of a study that we did to see whether young babies could categorize sounds as either consonant or dissonant. So in this method, it's called the conditioned head turn method, we play over and over again a bunch of consonant intervals. And then occasionally we change one of them to a dissonant interval. All the sounds are coming from, let's see if I can use this pointer. Yeah, all of the sounds are coming from the infant's left. And the infant is trained that if they turn their head when something changes in the sound, so this change to dissonant, they get rewarded by a toy jumping up and down for a few minutes. So we're conditioning them to respond uh, to this change. And here's just a little video of an infant doing this task. Okay. 
the dissonant one comes and the infant turns. And so then we just simply look at, do they turn more often if we present a control trial that's still consonant or a dissonant trial? And they, in fact, uh, from very early on, show that they can discrim discriminate these two categories of sounds. And even more interesting, they show a preference for consonants over dissonance. So here we took a little Mozart piece and we uh, rewrote one version to have uh, dissonance in it. So this is now a two-sided procedure. Uh, we flash a light on one side and the infant looks. At the light, we play one kind of music. And then we'll flash a light on the other side when the infant looks, we'll play the other kind of music. On each trial, the music stays on as long as the infant looks. So the infant controls how long they listen by when they, they turn away from it. And you'll see this baby's reaction. So by looking at across a number of trials, across a number of babies, we show that with different stimuli and so on, they also have a preference early on for consonants over dissonance. But at the same time that infants have this general capacity to, to discriminate uh, different sounds and different categories of sounds, they have a lot to learn. So for example, they're not born speaking a particular language. Um, and through experience, they become specialized for discriminations that matter to them in their environment. And they actually get worse at discriminations that don't matter in their environment. Uh, so for example, speech sound discriminations that matter in English but don't matter in Japanese. Japanese infants become worse at discriminating those over the first uh, year of life. And just to give you a, a cute example of this, um, here's two human voices and, you know, just raise your hand when you hear the voice change from one person to Balloon. another. Balloon. 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 Right. Balloon. Balloon. Okay, so that's very easy for you, right? Now try it for some rhesus monkey coos, okay? Yeah, so I had people raising their hand on every trial. Uh, in fact, that's really difficult for us. However, six-month-old babies can do that. They can tell which is the different rhesus monkey. But because that doesn't matter to you, your auditory system has become specialized for human voices. And by about 12 months of age, infants have lost the ability to discriminate monkey voices. Um, but they've gotten better at discriminating human voices. The same thing happens for musical pitch structure. So uh, here um, we have, this is a, an obscure piece by uh, Thomas Atwood, and it sounds like this. Okay, it goes on, it's maybe on the boring side, but it follows all the, the rules of Western tonality. In this version, we changed it so that the melody, the, the music is exactly the same, except on each beat, it uh, changes key. It goes up and down by semitone. It goes G, G flat, G, G flat, G, G flat. So all the consonants and dissonance is the same. The chords are all the same. The contours of the melodies are the same. But it sounds atonal. OK, so you get the idea. And then we test infants. We see, do they have a preference for one of these versions over the other? And surprisingly, they don't. Okay? It's not until about 12 months of age that they start to show a preference for the tonal version. Um, and not only do they show a preference for the tonal version, but if we compare infants who have been in active 
mums and babies music classes um, to infants who just had passive exposure in uh, an equal number of music classes, we see that there's a strong preference emerging in the group with the active music experience at 12 months, but not in the kids who are just getting the, the passive uh, exposure. So what this tells us is that preference for Western tonality, if you're listening in your environment to Western music, emerges around a year of age or so, and this enculturation is actually enhanced by experience. Okay, so in those early months, when you think, might think not much is going on in terms of musical development, there's a huge amount that's going on in terms of musical development, and mothers and fathers and other caregivers are using music as one of the, the means at their disposal for helping their babies to uh, self-regulate. We can also measure effects of experience on the brain in young babies, and we have a number of, of studies on this. I'll just um, give one example. This is what happens when the baby comes in. We measure their head uh, size so we get the right net. These are the geodesic nets that go on in, in just five minutes. Um, if you distract the baby with Big Bird, they're quite happy to have the net put on. And then we can measure brain responses. This is a very simple study. Um, we actually here compared those same kids that I showed you uh, uh, with the tonality preference. And this is just response, very simple study, response to a piano tone. At six months of age, uh, the two groups um, don't differ. The red line is the, the kids who will go into the active music classes, and the blue line is the kids who will go into the, the passive music classes. But by 12 months, we already see earlier and larger responses just to a piano tone in the, the kids with that active uh, musical experience. So this and, and a number of other studies tell us that a lot is going on, not only behaviorally, but we can measure this um, in brain responses. And I'll just show you this video because it's really cute. Uh, this was one of the infants in the, the, the class that got this early music training. It was Suzuki-based. Uh, they were trained between when they were six months of age and 12 months of age. Um, and a lot of it involved the mother holding the baby's hands with uh, the sticks to play a xylophone and helping the baby to play the xylophone. But the baby before this point had not been given the sticks to play on their own. And when we gave the sticks to um, kids in the control group who had no experience with the, with the xylophone, they mostly just ate the sticks and didn't really play them. But this was a typical response of a 12-month-old uh, to be given the sticks um, to play the xylophone. So he's very excited. He's doing very deliberate movements. Good job. He's trying to do the opposite Good hand movement, playing. which at 12 months is really hard for infants. Yeah, there you go. And that's, I should say Ellie that's David Barry, who was my Elliot. PhD student at the time, who, you like who was the play? with him there. Elliot. Elliot. So when I show this, <laughs> this video to you're music good. educators, they're, that, so they're usually know. amazed because they don't think that infants are capable of this. And it just, it just shows what experience, the, the big effect that, it, that experience can have. <laughs> okay, so I was just talking about pitch structures. Um, we also have, of course, in music, rhythmic structures and meter. And different cultures tend to emphasize different kinds of meter. In Western music, we tend to have complex pitch structures, but simpler rhythmic structures, although Messiaen, the music you heard earlier, is, is of course an exception to that. Um, but many other cultures have more complex rhythms in their folk music. Um, so uh, Aaron Hannon and Sandra Triab did a, a, a very nice set of studies where they looked at enculturation to meter 
And if you measure Western adults and you give them a Western meter, a simple 4-4 uh, meter, and you make a change in the meter, they're very good at detecting that change. But if you give them a Bulgarian meter that's, say, in 7-8, and you make a change to the meter, they, for the most part, don't detect it. So it's very difficult for them. However, if you look at six-month-old infants, they can detect meter changes in both cases. So again, this idea that they have some sensitivity to a, a large number of possible uh, stimuli, but by 12 months, they've, if they're Western exposed, uh, they've lost that ability to hear these complex meters, and they've become better at processing the simple meters. So I guess the, the sort of take-home message from this sort of set of studies that I've been telling you about is that um, that experience they have is wiring up their brain to become specialized for certain things. There's no sort of right and wrong, I think, in this. If you want to create someone who's very good at Western meters, this is the way to do it. If you want to create a musician who is able to and comfortable with all kinds of different meters, you should be exposing them to them when they're very young. Because by 12 months, the brain is already getting specialized. OK, so just to summarize this sort of first part, Young infants are sensitive to many musical features, including pitch, consonants and dissonance, meter, and rhythm. And then over the first year after birth, they become sensitive to discriminations that matter in their environment, things they've been exposed to, and less sensitive to things that don't matter. And enriched early experience can actually accelerate enculturation. So we have some evidence that if you're in a Western based uh, music class for infants, you lose the ability to discriminate complex meters earlier than an infant who isn't in that enriched um, environment. OK, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus really on the timing aspect of music. I think it's one of the reasons why music is so pervasive in human culture, and one of the reasons why music developed evolutionary evolutionarily in the first place. And so I'm going to ask questions like, why do rhythms affect us so powerfully? How are they processed in the brain? And how early in development are we affected by different rhythms? And so the first thing to note is that many biological systems are rhythmic. So we walk rhythmically, our heartbeats are rhythmic, speech has, uh, has a rhythmic structure. And in fact, um, it's also common across many different species. So you can go back, say, as far as a jellyfish, which has so few neurons, it arguably doesn't really even have a brain. And a jellyfish can execute beautiful rhythmic movement. So we know pretty much how to build a, a brain circuit that will execute uh, rhythmic movement. That isn't so difficult. What is a lot more challenging is one that can, can uh, perceive rhythms and produce uh, rhythmic movement at a lot of different tempos and flexibly and with other people and so on. OK, so why? what is it about rhythms that are so powerful? Well, I think probably the most important thing that rhythms give us is the ability to predict the future. Because they're regular, if I clap my hands, you know exactly when to expect my next clap. Right? So because of the regularity, they allow us to predict when the next important event is about to occur. And I've sort of started lately thinking about the brain as an organism that's constantly trying to predict its future, and then comparing its prediction against what actually happened, and then doing error correction if it's wrong, that's how you learn. Okay? You didn't predict correctly, so obviously there's some information that uh, you could uh, utilize better. So rhythms also help us with organization. So speech streams, rhythmic st uh, musical streams, just unfold continuously in time. And we have to chunk them into groups or phrases in order to make uh, sense of them. And the rhythm provides a scaffold on which we can put our organization. And as I'll show you uh, when I go through some of the data, 
rhythms are intimately connected with attention. So, for example, in the, if I just clap my hands, and then you know when the next strong beat is going to occur, I'll, I'll give you, I'm going to show you some brain data that, that shows that your t attention is focused on those points when you're predicting something interesting is going to happen. So musicians know very well, if you're going to play a wrong note, don't play it on a strong beat. Play it in between two strong beats, and people won't notice it as much as if you play it on a, on a strong beat. That's because our attention is constantly going up and down, and we're focusing on future, uh, when we think in the future, important things are going to happen. Prediction is involved in our, in our lives, and I'll just, maybe not all of you play basketball, but one of my sons plays basketball, so I, I have to always give the basketball um, example. Um, that's Russ Westbrook when he played um, college basketball. And as you can see, he's, he's, I should use this, he's trying to, he's trying to go in and score, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of other players around. Um, this guy has the ball, so he is going to predict that Russ is going to go this way, right? And then he's going to throw the ball, but he has to throw the ball before Russ gets there, or it won't be there when Russ gets there. So he has to predict where he's going to go. He has to predict that he's going to throw the ball, and the players on the other team have to predict that he's going to throw the ball there so that they can get there in order to be in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, to be a good basketball player, you have to, you know, be able to shoot and have good uh, sensory motor coordination and, and be tall and all sorts of other things. But the most important thing is to be able to predict. Look at a, at a series of players on a field, whether it's basketball or another sport, and be able to predict where everybody's going to be in the next few seconds. So same is true in music. In order to play together, we need to anticipate what we're going to play next and when to play it, and when the other players are going to play, when they're going to play things, and whether they're going to speed up and slow down, or play loudly or softly, or how they're going to phrase. So we're constantly predicting, because if we wait until we hear what another player does, it's too late, we're not with them. So it's all about prediction. Okay, so how are rhythms processed in the brain? Um, this is MEG, we, we've done MEG and um, EEG studies, and one of our initial studies, it's very simplistic, uh, we just play a series of isochronous uh, tones, and in one case it's at a faster tempo, in another case it's at a slower tempo, and we look at what happens in the brain. So here's a chunk of EEG or MEG uh, that we can measure, and we can decompose this signal into a series of sine waves, each one with a different frequency, so a high frequency, low frequency, uh, and then we can plot how much energy we have in the different frequencies over time, and we can analyze uh, the signals that way, and the, the next few slides I'm going to show you are data plotted like this. So here we have time along this axis. These red marks up here are the presentation of the isochronous tones. And then what's shown here is the different frequencies in the EEG signal from lower to higher. And what you'll notice is that in this middle band here, the beta band, there's a cycle between the red means there's a lot of beta power, the blue means there's not so much beta power. So it's going from high to low, high, low, high, low in a rhythmic pattern that exactly maps the input stimulus. So in the beta band, the power in the beta band is tracking uh, the timing of the rhythm. Okay, so we found, I think, uh, one of the brain processes that is involved in, in training to a beat. And now here, if we slow down the beat, so now you can see that the beats are spaced farther apart, we get the same pattern, but it's spread out in time, so it tracks this slower tempo. And even more interesting, perhaps, is so these red lines now represent the onset of the tones. You can see whether it's a fast tempo or a slow tempo, we get a, a sharp decrease in beta, 
And then how quickly beta rebounds depends on the tempo. So this rebound in beta, that is your brain predicting when it thinks the next beat is going to occur. Okay, so this is really the brain signature of the brain predicting the future. And when we play an auditory rhythm, so this is the person is just, this is from MEG, uh, the person is just staying as still as they possibly can in the MEG machine, um, and we get this kind of entrainment in auditory areas, but we also get it in a supplementary motor area, even in cerebellum. So large parts of the motor system are also entraining to the auditory rhythm even though there's no intention to move. And I'll show more and more evidence as I go that um, when we process auditory rhythms, we're using the motor parts of our brain in conjunction with the auditory parts to actually perceive uh, those rhythms. And evolutionarily, that makes sense because the motor system was here long before we had an auditory system. And this is why music makes you want to move to the beat. So if I play something that's highly groovy, it makes you want to move, right? Okay. Even though I don't see many of you moving, I'm sure you want to move. And I know your, your motor cortex is activated and entrained to the, to the music. Okay, so we also think that this is really a, a neural instantiation of the idea from that uh, Large and Jones had a couple of decades ago, where they said when you present a rhythm, not only does your brain encode the rhythm, but your attention goes up and down, which I've represented by this dotted line. And that fluctuation in attention seems to follow the beta fluctuation in power. So we're interested in um, attention and how uh, beta band can, uh, is involved in prediction. And one of the things that we looked at was, so far I've just been talking about temporal prediction, so you can predict, predict when the next beat is going to happen. But what if there's something unexpected that happens at the beat. So the beat's at the right time, but say it's the wrong pitch, okay, an unexpected pitch. Is beta band sensitive to that, or is that processed in some other system? And so we presented um, a simple experiment where 10% of the time at random, we introduced a different pitch, but everything was at the right time. And we looked at the brain's reaction to that. And in fact, you, you of course get, for those of you who do EEG, you get all the, the low frequency uh, evoked responses to that. But if you filter all of that stuff out um, in the beta band, so beta is like 20 cycles per second. So this is a fast oscillation. You get a big increase in beta band activity um, after the onset of that unexpected pitch. So the beta band is, is processing not only expectations for when things are going to happen, it's also processing expectations for what is going to happen. And so we wanted to really get at this idea of predictability and is beta band really involved in prediction? So we wanted to use a little bit more controlled stimulus. So what we did is we presented one stimulus in which every fifth note was changed to a different pitch. Um, so that's completely predictable. You know when those pitch changes are going to happen. And then we presented a random case. So still 20% of the time there was a change in pitch, but you didn't know when it was going to happen. And so then we looked at beta band differences in these two conditions. And what you find is, is in the uh, predictable case, we get a very clear um, desynchronization and resynchronization prior to the deviant tone. Whereas in the case where it's unpredictable, you don't know when this deviant tone is going to occur, uh, that's much less pronounced. And you can see that here. So when it's predictable, there's a big decrease in beta activity before 
that predictable pitch change, but you don't get it when it's not predictable. So prediction really is at the heart of what's going on. And we can look at this in a little uh, more detail. So we look now at individual trials. So this was all in the case where it's completely predictable. Every fifth note is a pitch change. But sometimes you're more attentive than you are at other times. And so on some trials, there's a big decrease in beta prior to the onset of this pitch. And on other trials, there's a smaller decrease in beta prior to the onset of the pitch. And so we think that the brain, in this case, is really paying attention and it's really expecting this pitch change. In this case, you're not very entrained and the brain isn't really very, uh, isn't processing well the perception or the prediction that the pitch change is coming. And then we can look at what happens after that pitch change. Okay, so the pitch change then happens. In this case, you're sort of prepared for it. In this case, you're not. And we can measure a component of the evoked potential called the P3A, which is basically um, how surprised you are, uh, error detection, uh, uh, initiation of error detection. And in the case where you predicted the pitch, you get almost no P3A response. But in the case where you didn't have a good beta, and we think you didn't predict the pitch very well, you have a big response that's saying, hey, whoa, now, now I'm paying attention because something happened I didn't predict. Okay, so we can go from prior expectation now to post-reaction, and we can relate those two. So there's a correlation between what happens before and what happens after. So just to summarize this uh, beta data, beta oscillations, so these are fast oscillations around 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second. They entrain the power of the beta entrains to the tempo of the incoming stimulus. This beta desynchronization, this decrease in beta power, occurs in reaction to hearing the beat. And the resynchronization predicts, the slope of that resynchronization predicts the onset of the next beat. So beta power reflection reflects predictions for what will occur next. And the depth of modulation predicts upcoming attention and actual performance. I didn't present those data, but we have new data suggesting that we can predict from how deep the beta modulation is before we present a very small pitch change, how good your performance is going to be on detecting that pitch change. So this beta uh, modulation, it's not only predicting the timing, but it's actually sharpening your perception at certain points in time. So it's really important for processing in general. And of course, music has pitch, has these uh, rhythmic structures, and it makes um, predictions really important in music. Music is all, always setting up predictions for what's going to happen next, controlling our attentional system and, and our affect, and so on. So then we can go further and we can say, well, so far I've just been talking within one person's brain. But music is usually something that we do with other people. So we don't do it by ourselves. And this complicates the situation a lot. So we, we need to have a model of our own future actions because we have to plan our motor actions before we execute them. But we also need a model of the future intentions of the other musicians. And I think in the, the jazz that we've been hearing, uh, the improvisation we've been hearing through the day, uh, is probably when this is most evident. Okay? So you have to be listening to the other person, reacting to what they're doing, but also predicting what they're doing so that you're together with them. So we've started doing some investigations of nonverbal information flow between musicians. Um, this is the, the live lab that is um, newly constructed. It's just uh, two years old now at McMaster University uh, in Hamilton in Canada. And it's a 100-seat fully functioning concert hall, uh, but it's equipped with all kinds of, of uh, 
tools for us to play with. Uh, so you can't see it very well here, but there are uh, about 75 loudspeakers throughout the space and microphones hanging down from the ceiling. So we've gone to great lengths to sound isolate it from the outside and to uh, make its natural, um, make the natural environment very low reverberation. But the microphones pick up what's going on in all the different areas of the lab and uh, in real time calculate what echoes we want and feed those through the speakers so we can recreate Carnegie Hall, um, a metro underground station, um, outdoors, um, or virtually any environment that we want. Um, we can measure EEG in, in multiple audience members and other physiology as well. And it's equipped with motion capture cameras, and that's what I'm going to focus on now. So we've done studies of motion capturing 100 people in the audience at once, um, and several musicians as they're playing, and so on. Um, so I just throw that out there for those of you who do research and are interested in such a facility. Um, it's there. So one of the first studies we did was with um, one of Canada's uh, pre premier uh, piano trios, the Griffin Trio. And uh, these little hats that they're wearing on their head are from the dollar store. I don't know what you call that in Sweden, but... Um, they have the, the cheapest method of putting some, electro, uh, some um, markers on, on someone's head. So these are just reflective markers that the motion capture cameras can um, pick up. And so we have 28 cameras and they um, look at these markers from all the different angles and we reconstruct um, three-dimensional models of how they're moving. Um, so in this first sort of trial study, we just said, okay, play this piece of music uh, as expressively as you can. Now play it without expression, but still playing it as accurately and as together as you can. And this is an example of what the motion capture looks like. So this is the, the sort of triangle, uh, actually uh, four-sided figures at the top are from their head, and that sort of showing their head and shoulders. So this is without sound. They're playing the same piece. Can you tell which one is the expressive version and which one is not? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. The top one is the expressive version. So they really move their bodies differently when they're playing expressively. And of course, uh, people study these gestures that, that musicians make, and they're not necessary for just playing the notes. But what they seem to be involved in is expression. So these sort of, we call it body sway. So we analyzed um, some of this body sway. So for example, um, if we just look in the, the, the uh, plane in which they, they move the most, um, this is the movements of musician one, this is the movements of musician two over time. And then if we want to look at is one musician influencing another musician, and here's the key, we use, we use a technique called Granger causality, and we say, okay, I'm gonna take a specific point in time, and then I'm going to look at the movements that this musician made just before that point in time, uh, and see if I can then predict where they're gonna be here. And you can, you can predict pretty well. And then over and above that, if I take that same chunk of time just before this point in time from musician two, can I predict where musician one is going to be over and above prediction within the musician? So in other words, from the movements of one musician, can you predict how the other musician is going to move in the immediate future? And the answer is yes, you can. And uh, in this study, we just did a very simple thing of we added up all of the, the couplings um, of how each musician was influencing each other one. And whether they were playing happy or sad music, there was more coupling of their body sway when they were played expressively than non-expressively. So there are differences that we can measure uh, between how they appear to be communicating with each other. So then we went on to, to look um, in a, sort of a more detailed or controlled study of information transfer. And here we used uh, two high-level string quartets one of them play classical music, the other play Baroque music. 
And on each short trial, we secretly assigned one person as said, you are the leader and the others are to follow. And we had them come in with a metronome beat so they couldn't um, take the cue um, f from that. Again, we used Granger causality. So say we had assigned violin two as the leader, then uh, w these um, blue lines here indicate, we can look at how much is violin two's movements influencing the cello's movements, how much the viola movement and how much the other violin and come up with a sum of leader-follower in influences. We can do the opposite, follower to leader, how much are the followers influencing the leader, and then the green represent follower to follower. Okay, so we have these three categories of, of influence. And when you do this, uh, this is, sorry, a little bit complicated because we had conditions where they could see each other or not, but what you see is this is these represent leader to follower, and the Granger causality is higher than in the other two cases. So the leaders are actually influencing the other members more than the other members are influencing each other or the leader. And we can change this dynamic of information flow um, by assigning different people as the leader. Um, same was true for, for classical music, but I won't go into that. And then importantly, ratings of how good the performance was correlate with the overall causal density. So if we add up how much information flow there is among all the players, that's related to how well the performance went. Okay, so it's not just something that doesn't matter, it actually affects the quality of the performance. So we conclude then that that body sway reflects predictive information transfer among musicians. And we also have EEG data now that we're looking at hyperscanning of EEG data to see influences from one um, brain to another. So an important consequence of the ability to predict what I've been showing you there, uh, so in the, the past uh, few minutes, there's another important consequence of the ability to predict, and that is that you can entrain your movements to a rhythm. So you can, essentially, you can dance to the rhythm, right? So as I mentioned, just listening to music causes oscillatory brain activity in motor regions of the brain, and there's these privileged connections between auditory and motor areas that both entrain uh, brain oscillations to the beat of the music, but what allows you to actually dance to the music is that you can predict when that's going to happen and so then you can actually use your body and you can move in time to the music. If you waited to hear the beat and then tried to move, it would be too late. And in fact, from uh, some really elegant studies done by Hugo Merchant and his group on um, rhesus monkeys, uh, that seems to be what the monkeys do. So it takes a long time to entrain them to, to pull a lever to a beat and then they seem to be pulling it in a reactive manner. So they hear the beat and then they pull the lever. Whereas humans actually tend to move ahead of the beat. So we anticipate the beat. So we seem to do something that's quite different from most other species. Okay, back to infants, because after all, I am a developmental psychologist. Can infants entrain to the beat? Well. Probably not. Uh, infants are very responsive. They move when you play them rhythmic movement and so on, but they don't seem to have the motor control yet to actually move in time to a beat. But we thought, what if we move them? Can we show any evidence that they're using their motor system in conjunction with their auditory system to process rhythms? So what we did was we took an ambiguous rhythm, so just the way you have an ambiguous you know, face vase visual illusion, you can take a six beat auditory pattern and you can divide it into three. I like to be in America. America is divided into groups of two, right? So you can have two groups of three or three groups of two. And if you don't put accents in, the rhythm is ambiguous. It could be heard in both uh, different ways. So 
we created a, a little rhythm that sounds like this when I think this is in three. Oops. Sorry, this is in two. One, two. So can you all hear that's in two? Okay, here's exactly the same rhythm, but it's now with accents every third beat. Do you hear the difference? So we took our ambiguous rhythm. Now we play it without accents to babies. And we bounce them, half of them we bounce on every third beat, half of them we bounce on every second beat, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you those cute videos. But the bottom line is that afterwards, we give them a preference test. Do they prefer the duple rhythm or the triple rhythm? And if they were bounced on every second beat, they prefer to listen to the rhythm with accents on every second beat. If they were bounced on the triple rhythm, they prefer to listen to the rhythm with accents every third beat. So the way that they move, the way we moved them, influenced how they heard that rhythm, how they perceived that rhythm. So very young, there are these connections between auditory and motor areas. So even though infants don't have good control of their movements, there's still this privileged relation between auditory and motor areas of the brain for rhythm. I'm going to skip this brain stuff, because I want to end um, with um, sort of maybe a broader question that will probably connect more now with some of the talks uh, that we heard this morning. And that is, we know that when we play music with other people, we feel an affinity for those people. So we use music whenever we want to feel a common emotion. And it can be um, singing uh, in a church together. It can be at a party where you want to connect with the people at the party. Uh, it can be a mother singing uh, with her baby. Uh, it can be people moving um, at a rock concert. And it can also be an army uh, who have the common goal of going out and uh, destroying the enemy. So in all of these cases, playing that music together, feeling that rhythm together, seems to unite the group socially and have them feel a common feeling and um, then perhaps even go out and perform um, actions in, together as a group. So moving together, there's a number of studies now in adults showing that moving together has social consequences. After moving in synchrony with someone, uh, people rate their partner as liking that person more. Uh, they cooperate more with them in a in a game like Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, they rate them as trusting them more. So just a short period of actually moving in synchrony with someone compared to moving out of synchrony with someone already has uh, a social uh, consequence for us. So we asked, how early in development can we see this? And in this uh, study I'm going to describe, we looked at 14-month-old infants because that's the youngest age that we can actually measure overt helping behaviors. We have other methods of looking at infants' perceptions of social behaviors younger. But at 14 months, an infant will, you know, if someone accidentally drops a pencil that they're using, uh, an infant will sometimes pick up the pencil and hand it back. Okay, so engage in what we think of as early altruistic behaviors. So what we did is, you can see here that the uh, this person is just the bouncer. So she's got the infant in a carrier and she's going to bounce the infant. She's listening to the music over a beat, or she's listening to a beat track over headphones, so she just bounces according to what she hears in her headphones. This person is the experimenter, and I should mention, this is Laura Sorelli, who uh, was my graduate student who did uh, most of this work. And so she bounces according to what she hears in her headphones. And sometimes she's going to bounce in sync with the baby, and other babies she's not going to bounce in sync with them. And then the baby bounces and hears um, the music twist and shout. 
So it looks like this. Okay, and then after that, the infant does a series of helping tasks. So they have 30 seconds in each case to help the experimenter. Yeah, so she dropped her clothespin, and now will the baby help? So here's an example of out of sync bouncing. And will this baby help? There. Uh oh. Oh no. Whoopsie. After bouncing for just two and a half minutes like this, infants are almost twice as likely to help if they bounced in sync as bounced out of sync. That's, you know, in developmental psychology, that's a huge effect. And interestingly, if they bounce at the right tempo but they bounce out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase, we get the same level of helping in the baby. So it doesn't have to be exactly the same movement but what matters is that the tempo is correct. The effects are socially targeted, so this person here, just a neutral stranger who doesn't actually bounce with them, they won't increase their helping towards her. So it's not just that this puts them in a good mood, bouncing in sync with someone puts you in a good mood and you help anybody. It's targeted to the person that you bounced with. However, if it's shown that the person that you bounced with is a friend of someone else, then they will increase their helping towards that friend if you bounced in sync with them, but not if you didn't bounce in sync with them. So infants are using this synchrony cue uh, very early to decide who to befriend, who to trust, and how to navigate these complicated um, social relationships that they have to uh, figure out how to deal with. So let me just sort of summarize the whole talk. Uh, young infants are very responsive to music. They process musical cues very early. And through this process of enculturation, infants become sensitive to discriminations that matter in their environment. These beta band oscillations in the brain reflect predictive processing for both what's going to happen next and when it's going to happen. Auditory rhythms are processed with motor areas of the brain. And music, rhythms, and movement are a cue that infants use to navigate their social world and decide who to trust and who to befriend. So of course, I have a, a lot of people who, who do a lot of this work. I, I have a, a great lab. and, and uh, here are some of the, the people in my lab. Okay, thanks very much.